So my name is Brian Hughes. I'm a front-end developer at RDO. We're a music streaming company, for those of you who haven't heard of us. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about a few of the other features in ECMAScript 6 that aren't being talked about as much. I hope you've been to some of the other ECMAScript 6 talks today. There's been some really good ones. Uh, so let's get started. So ECMAScript 6 is coming out pretty soon. Uh, word on the street is that the spec should hopefully be finalized sometime by the end of this year, maybe early next year. And browsers, we should start seeing like really good support, you know, across the board support sometime in 2016, 2017. That's word on the ground anyways. Of course, that could change at a moment's notice. But you know, it's gonna look good. So first of all, here's what I'm not gonna talk about today. These are like the big things everyone's talking about. We're getting classes, which is awesome. We are getting modules, which is also really awesome. Uh, we're getting promises, which we talked about earlier today. And we're also getting generators, which have been talked about a few times. But I'm not gonna talk about that. First, I'm gonna talk about Blotscope variables. So actually, I bet a lot of you have heard this before, but just for anyone who hasn't, you know, I just wanna make sure that you know what this is about, because I'm gonna be using these today. So as you probably know, uh, variables in JavaScript are not block scoped, they're function scoped. So if you declare a variable inside of an if statement, you can reference it outside. And this is you know, different than how most languages work. Well, they're introducing a new keyword called let. And the let keyword basically says, this is gonna be in this block only. So if we take a look at this example code here, uh, we have you know, an if statement, and we say let foo equal one. And then after that, we have const var equals two. So yes, const will actually be a part of the language, and it will also be block scoped. And so uh, then if we try to modify it, you know, we get exceptions. If we try to access these things outside, we also get exceptions. So if we run this code, we get this as an output. And this is great. So next up, I'm gonna talk about template literals. Uh, these used to be called quasi-strings if you've been following you know, the spec process at all. And basically this is templating, like uh, it's most similar to underscore templates, but you can also think mustache handlebars, except it's built into the language and it looks like this. Uh, you can see we use the backtick character to specify a template string, just because it was kind of the only quote we had left on the keyboard. And you use the dollar sign and then curly braces around it. And you can put any JavaScript expression you want inside of that and it will be evaluated. So when we run this code, we get hello bar. So, pretty cool. Moving on to object literals, we uh, have some new ways of specifying properties inside of it, and there's what's called computed property names. And what this allows you to do is you have a variable that has you know, a string or something that can be coursed to a string in it, and you put it in your object literal inside of square brackets. And what this means is it says take the value of your variable and dump it in as the key name. So you can think like this is useful for mix-ins and things like that. So when we run this code, you see we're referencing object.foo, which is you know, the value of my prop, we get bar back. Uh, all right, so another object literal uh, modification is we now have a shorter way of specifying functions inside of an object literal. So I, this is a very common that you know, we add functions inside of it. So now we can skip doing uh, you know, key colon function and all this stuff. Instead, we just simply do the name of the function, parentheses with whatever your arguments are, and then the body. So whenever we do something like this, we get bar back. So this is great for saving a lot of characters. And plus, it's also a named function too, which is kind of nice. Uh, so getting out of object literals, we now have uh, what are called rest parameters. So uh, who here has ever used the arguments keyword? And who here hates using the arguments keyword, right? Pretty much everyone. Arguments was something of an abomination that was sort of like an array, but not exactly, and you get tripped up by it. And so they said, you know what, let's do something new. So they came up with this concept of rest parameters. The idea is you have your arguments to your function, and then you do a dot, 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 you have three dots, and then the name of some other identifier. And basically what this says is take all the rest of the arguments passed into the function, and put them inside of an array that has the name of whatever comes after the dot. So in this case, we're creating an array called rest, and this is an actual array, and you can iterate over it and do all the typical array things you do. So when we run this code where we're passing in five parameters, we can see that you know, A and B are, of course, one and two. The uh, rest is actually an array, and then we get three, four, five inside of that array. 
Now this is also nice because you don't ha you can have you know parameters that are always required at the beginning that could be totally unrelated to whatever's in your rest. So this prevents you know back in the argument say after you course it to array, you might still have to do a splice or a slice or something like that to get just what you're interested in. And so this uh, I think is a little more elegant. There's another new thing coming called spread, which is pretty much the opposite of rest. So this is whenever you want to call a method, you can take an array, and you basically take the values of that array and you sort of spread it out as the rest of the arguments. This is sort of analogous to doing uh, you know, function.call or apply, except that it's also nice like uh, the rest operator in that you know, it's sort of like partial. You can give it an explicit uh, argument, and then you can spread out the array after that. So in this specific case, what it will do is it will take this array with three elements and basically apply that to the rest of the function after the first one. So when we run this code, we indeed get one, two, three, four as a result. So pretty cool. Uh, another thing that I think is really cool is we ha now have what's called the for of statement. Now, of course, everyone I'm sure is familiar with for loops. You probably use the for in loop for iterating over keys in an object. Well, now we also have the for of, and it's just you know, another variance. And what this looks like is we have for, you know, your initializer, just like in a for in, except the of keyword instead. And what this does is this allows us to basically iterate over each val uh, element inside of the array. So this is different than for in. For in will give you a key back, you know, because arrays are ultimately objects. For of gives you the value back instead of the key. And so when you want to iterate over an array, this is a really clean, really elegant way of doing it where you don't have to mess around with indices, you don't have to use for each, you know, or each if you're using underscore or low dash, and we can easily get all our values out. So when we run this, we get A, B, and C. So nice and compact. Now, of course, you don't always want to use a for of array. Anytime you need an indice, say you want to modify the array, you want to you know, splice something out, you can't use four of them in that case because you don't get that uh, index in it. But for I think a lot of cases with arrays, you know, this is, this is going to be great. All right, so moving on to probably my favorite uh, feature coming is destructuring. This was briefly sort of hinted at in, uh, in an earlier talk today, uh, the one talking about like processes and macros and stuff like that. Uh, so what destructuring is, the way I like to think about it, is it's very analogous to tuples in Python. Um, does anyone else here know much Python? Uh, okay, so a few. Uh, so you probably run into tuples. And the idea with tuples in Python is you can return more than one thing from a function. Well, under the hood, this is kind of different semantics, but you are essentially doing the same thing. The idea is you have some complex object, and you want to break it apart into like simpler parts and assign those to other variables. So in this case, we have an array uh, you know, with two elements in it. And you can see we have the special let statement where we have brackets that says, okay, we have an array and we want to break it apart. And this goes on you know, the left-hand side of an assignment. And you basically give it the names of the identifiers you want and it will basically do a, like a pattern match. It will take the first two elements out of the array on the right-hand side, break it apart, and assign it to those two variables. So when we run this, we indeed get one and two. So this is going to allow us to get really, really concise code. I mean, how many times have we all done the pattern where we call a function, we get an array back, and then we got to assign it to a temporary variable, and then we create two more variables to get those first two elements that we go on. So this is essentially doing that all wrapped up into a single line. So I think this is awesome. Now, they took it a step further, though. So this is basically how you do tuples in Python. Now, the next thing, Python actually doesn't have an equivalent of, at least not yet. And that's because you can also destructure an object, not just an array. So what you can do here is you know, we create an object, and then we say let, once again, you know, we're, this is on the right-hand side, but instead of the square brackets, we use uh, curly brackets, saying that we're going to destructure an object. And what you do is on the, each of these little sub-elements here, you give the name of the property you want on the left, and the name of the variable you want to assign it to on the right of that colon. So in this case, we're going to take you know, the property, uh, the value of the one property, and we'll assign it to A. And we'll take the value of the two property and assign it to B. And so when we run this, we get one and two back. So I think this is even more uh, powerful. You can think about if you have you know, a rest call or something like that where you're getting an object back. And you know, the first thing you do is 
once again, you, you assign that to a temporary variable, and then you create two more variables in which you're aliasing out those properties you want. Or if you're not doing that, you're constantly referencing, you know, response dot, response dot, response dot all throughout your code. And so this is a way of, you know, just really cleaning that up. And so these are cool features. But I think the really great thing about this is when we start mixing these up together. You know, each one of these is kind of nice in its own way, but you start combining them and you can really start creating uh, shorter, more concise code, and I think more readable code too. And more readable code means more maintainable. So just as a little contrived example, uh, this is kind of bringing a lot of stuff together. So first we're creating two variables, A and B, uh, and we're giving them some name uh, properties or strings first and last, and we're using these as properties. So we have a computed property. You can see we're doing A and B as computed property. So we're basically creating these two objects with a first property and a last property. Now these are also functions. So it's a function called first and a function called last that takes one parameter. And you see we have its function body, body after that. And what this is doing is it's essentially taking a template. You know, you, it takes this one parameter and will turn a template that modifies its output based on whatever you pass into it. So you can think of this as, you know, say, a model in which you're calling like, you know, a, a get last name, get first name. And it makes it, you know, pretty prints it for you. So then we have this function that uh, called print that's going to print things out in last name comma first. You know, this is like a formatter. And uh, of course, we are using the rest operator. And we are passing in these two objects just as arguments. You know, so this is not an array of people. These are just arguments to print. So we're using the rest operator to basically get those into an array. And then we're iterating over that array using a for of. So, and inside of this for of though, you notice that we actually have a destructuring assignment in your initializer for that for of. So instead of just assigning it to one property, we're assigning it to two. So we're looping over this array, destructuring out, and you notice there's only one reference to the array, no references to any temporary variables. And then we log out uh, their name. We're capitalizing the last name and not capitalizing the first. Why would you want to do that? Yeah, I don't know, this is just for the example. But you know, this is really concise. And when we, when we run this, we get Jones, Alice, and Smith, Bob, written really short. So what would this look like today? Just as an example, you know, how much is this actually saving us? So I decided to code this up in ES5. And it looks like that. It's about 40% longer in terms of actual number of characters. So not only is it more code, it's a lot more dense too. And there's some interesting stuff going on. Like you can see we're doing this array.prototype.slice.apply thing to arguments, which if you've seen that before, you probably just memorized that as this is how you make arguments in array. And actually, you know, deciphering it, you gotta sit there and think for a minute. Okay, what is, uh, wait, why are we referencing the array prototype? Okay, what's a slice? Let me look up slice real quick. And so you're having to do all this like kind of mental math to figure out what's going on with it. And also you look at, you know, when we're creating these objects, there's just, a lot of stuff to it and a lot of different assignments and these could be mixed around anywhere. So this could be very, very ugly code. And at best, it's only somewhat ugly code. Now we'll say if you are using ECMAScript 6 today, there are ways of doing this. There's a compiler alt out there called Tracer, I believe is how it's pronounced from Google. And it basically treats ECMAScript 6 like a compile to language, you know, like CoffeeScript or something like that. So you can use it in browsers today. And when you use a tool like that, it would actually take the previous slide, this slide, and it will convert it to this under the hood. So this is actually what we'll be running today. Uh, and, but that's a good way to play with it today. You can get to know it. And in fact, every single code example you saw in this, I ran through Tracer and actually worked. And so if you want to grab the slides, here's uh, some links to them. And I'll also post this on Twitter, of course, you know, hashtag for JS. And there's some more links in there uh, as well. So the actual code, you can grab, uh, I have a little snippet out there. And that code is just in a Tracer enabled website so you can run it via the console and um, have fun. All right, uh, questions? Uh, yeah, sure, so when you're doing the uh, object destructuring, that's not mm -hmm. messing with prototypes or anything, right? that's just Correct. Like properties, okay. Yes, yeah, so it's just properties on it. Uh, now, if you have an object that has like a prototype and uh, properties going up, it will search up the prototype chain. You know, it's a normal property lookup mechanism. Yes. 
Yes, uh, sorry, I didn't repeat the earlier question. So the question was, if you do a destructuring of an array, but you don't match up its length, let's say you uh, have three variables on the right, but your array is only two long, then yes, that third variable will get the value undefined. It's just like you're referencing, you know, an, the bracket index that's out of bounds, so the same thing. Yes, and if there is more elements in the array than what you're dereferencing, they are ignored. And same thing with uh, properties on an object as well. If you try to reference a property that doesn't exist, you'll get undefined. And if there are extra properties on the object, they're ignored. Uh, so the question was, uh, if you're destructuring an array, can you use the dot, dot, dot syntax inside of it on, on the left-hand side? So you do let bracket a, comma b, comma dot, dot, dot rest. Um, you know, I'm not 100% certain, but I seem to recall that you can. I would probably need to read the spec, though, to tell you for certain. Just kind of like, this is new to me, but this mm -hmm. is Yeah. I, I seem to recall seeing it before, but you know, I don't want to tell you, you know, yes, that's absolutely it, and then turn out to be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering, so the question is, is, has there been a proposal to ECMAScript uh, or to TC39 that will basically combine for in and for of such that you get back both the key and the value? Uh, there isn't currently. Um, it's possible it was discussed and then dropped, but uh, nothing at the moment. Uh, and you know, I think on that, it's probably going to be a pretty rare occurrence, um, especially you know, if you need that index. It, once you have the index, it is really easy to get the property. So, uh, yeah, you might be able to save a little bit, but it's probably not going to help you that much. Yes. Uh, okay, so the question is, what is the difference between for each and for of? Uh, they're actually basically the same thing. Uh, so if you're not familiar, for each is a method on the function <coughs> prototype. So every fu or sorry, not a function on every array prototype. So every array has a, a function you call called for each, and you give it a callback, and I'll call it back for each element. It's sort of it's basically the same thing, but the difference is that with for each, you have an extra function call. Now sometimes you actually want this because you, you know you want each callback to or each iteration to be sort of in its own context. Uh, so this is useful, for example, if you do an async call inside of it, you know you need to make capture the state. If you do in a loop, you know it's going to loop on pass, and your index is all screwed up. Uh, but aside from, and obviously with a for of, you don't have that. But uh, other than that, they're basically the same thing. Now, another difference, though, is that for of uh, will most likely be much, much faster, you know, once we get implementations out there. One of the problems with a, a for each is that you have to actually make a function call for each element. And function calls are, you know, kind of expensive in JavaScript. You have to create a new context, potentially new closures, and, you know, all sorts of things like that. All right, well, that's uh, actually time for our next stop, so that was perfect. Thank you.